When I was a real little kid, I had all the full-blown um, symptoms of autism. I was born in 1947. No speech until uh, three and a half to four years of age. And I got really good early educational intervention. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early educational treatment. It's just super important. And by the time I was two and a half years old, I had speech therapy. I had um, a, a nanny when I was age three who just played constant turn-taking games with me and my sister. We've got to work teaching these kids to take turns. And that was taught to me with board games. Really important thing. I think sometimes there's not enough expectations for behavior. You know, my 50s upbringing now, finding now and I see a lot of the younger people, a lot of them that are less severe than I was, uh, they're not being taught just some of the basic uh, living skills, being on time, table manners, things like that. That was really emphasized. Now, a good teacher has to kind of know how much to intrude. If you intrude too much, you're going to go into sensory overload. You don't push enough, you don't get any advancement. And, you know, in those, these little kids, they need at least 20 or 30 hours a week of connected to the world. Now, sensory problems occur with many, many different disorders. Now, one, another thing is, I want to get you kind of away from all these labels. Right now, the American Psychiatric Association is going to be removing Asperger's from the um, autism, taking out PDD. The problem is, these labels are not precise. It's sort of like profiling bad guys or something like that. It's not precise. And sensory issues can overlap a lot of different lab labels. Dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD. In fact, I was just reading some um, new genetics research that's showing that some of the same genetic factors are in the autism spectrum and in ADHD. And I get worried and they're going to take out the Asperger uh, label. You know, label some of these kids oppositional defiant. And I don't know. You know, I, that, I sometimes have problems with some of that kind of stuff. One of the reasons why some of these kids get oppositional is they don't have a good teacher to get them motivated. And this is another big beef I've got with the schools is they've taken out so many of, my, of the hands-on classes. The hands-on classes, those were the classes that just absolutely saved me. You know, uh, art. If I hadn't had art when I was in elementary school, I would have gotten nowhere fast. Now, when I was a little kid, loud sounds hurt my ears. You know, it's like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. Now, I want to emphasize that sensory issues in autism and other disorders, don't get hung up on these labels. You know, you're trying to figure out how to help a kid, why don't you figure out what his particular problem is? Does he have a problem with sensory overload every time he goes into a big, uh, big shopping mall, he's screaming his head off? Does he feel like he's in the rock speaker, uh, rock speaker inside the, I'm kind of tired tonight, sorry. Um, you know, that he's at inside the light show and the uh, rock and roll speaker, or he's got problems with socializing. You gotta figure out what exactly his problem is and then correct the problem, not just get all hung up on the label. Autism uh, sensory problems are extremely variable. One child's gonna have a lot of problems with noise sensitivity. Another kid, it's not gonna be that big a problem. In some kids, it's very debilitating and you're gonna have to turn it off because it's driving me crazy with that light, sorry. Um, you can run it without the light, fine. But I've got to turn away from this light because that's bothering me. So if they want, they're going to have to have a choice between your light or that light. So I think, um, but I just, I, I just can't. The other reason why it drives me crazy is the camera's moving. It's not on a tripod. It's constantly moving. You see, and this gets into some of the distraction problems. And when I get tired, all of these problems get worse. And I just, you know, if you put it over there on a tripod and had a light on it, I probably could tolerate it. But if it's there moving there in front of me, it's just, it's just way too distracting. The thing about sensory issues is they can vary from being a minor nuisance to being completely debilitated. I know some people where they're so debilitated with sensory issues that they can't leave a darkened house. That's going to make living pretty impossible. Now, the thing is, you go and test a kid's hearing, auditory threshold will be normal. The ability to hear faint sounds, that will be normal. But, the, but where you have a problem is auditory detail. 
That's the ability to hear hard, constant sounds. Many, many, many disorders, you can't hear hard, constant sounds. So my speech teacher would say, cut, cut. Then she'd stretch out and enunciate those hard consonants. I just cannot emphasize enough how important that is. And then some people's hearing is like a bad mobile phone, cutting in and out. Tension shifting slowness, you got that with many disorders. It takes much longer to shift back and forth between two different things. Like I hear a cell phone over there ring and I left mine back in the hotel on the charger, so it's not gonna ring, though I have had the embarrass embarrassment of having my phone ring during a meeting. There's too much little motion up in the front, I have problems with that because it distracts me and it takes me much longer to get my train of thought back. And when I get tired, it all gets worse. And last night my flight got delayed uh, and they got us loaded onto the plane and they pulled the jet bridge back. And then the pilot said, well, there's bad weather in Calgary, so um, uh, we're gonna have to put the jet bridge back and we gotta kick eight people off the plane, eight people's worth of fuel. You know, they're gonna put more fuel on the plane and they gotta <laughs> throw eight people off so they can put more fuel on the plane. And uh, that wasted a whole hour doing that. Now, if you look at this picture, you've got people with autism and normal people hooked up to special computerized glasses where they could track where the person was looking. And they have them watch a movie, and the normal person looks at the eyes. But there's something else that this shows. Look at how many times the normal person looks back and forth. And look at how many times the red line looks back and forth. The red line's looking at the map because they have trouble hearing. But this really shows you the problem with the tension shifting. Tension shifting is slow. This goes across many disorders. Don't get hung up and locked into these labels now. Now, another kind of sensory problem you can get, now I don't have this problem, because if I had it, I wouldn't be a visual thinker, is where visual images will break up, sort of like a mosaic, sort of like the kind of reactions people have when they have a migraine. It, it's, um, it's just, um, uh, this, these, these people will tend to be an auditory thinker. Now, what's a sign that a child has got a visual processing problem? They often do a lot of flicking around the eyes. He may tilt his head to read. They often hate escalators. But the big one is gonna be fluorescent lights, 60 cycle fluorescent lights. And they can see the flicker and it's flickering like a strobe light. They have difficulty catching a ball. Eye exams will be normal because the problem is back here in the head. You see, in the back of your head, you got circuits for color, shape, and motion. They gotta work together. Well, they're not working together right, and you're getting the visual images getting scrambled up. Some kids label dyslexic, autistic, learning problems, sensory processing disorder, and other things. When they go to read, they will see the print jiggle on the page. Now, there's some very, very simple things that you can do for this problem. And you're probably not gonna be doing very well in school if you have this problem. Well, the first thing we need to do is get rid of the 60 cycle fluorescent lights if possible. You know, now there's gonna be new energy saving technologies coming in. Hopefully we'll solve some of the problems with the fluorescent lights. But if there's one thing I could do to the schools, it'd be to ban 60 cycle fluorescent lights. And, and but let's say you're stuck with them. Get the child's over by the window. Or get a 100 watt lamp and put it next to their desk. Not one of those twirly things that screws in, but the old-fashioned hot energy waster kind of lamp. <laughs> and some, a laptop computer doesn't flicker. Laptop's the one computer that does not flicker. 